do it that well. It shall be the whole of the law. Welcome to uh, today's class, little get together discussion. Uh, this is Star Ruby, an examination of Lieber 25. Um, happy you guys could be here. There's, it's pretty good turnout. Um, please note that uh, the class is free, but your donation of five to ten dollars would be hugely appreciated. We're trying to get our own space, and as soon as COVID allows us to meet in person, um, you can check out our website, pdxoto.org. Thank you so much for your support. We love you. Um, so today's class is on the Star Ruby, which is originally from the Book of Lies, Libra 333, Chapter 25. It was later republished um, in Magic Without Tears, Libra Abba, Book 4, Part 3. Um, want to say before we begin that uh, as we always as we always do in these in these classes of ours your mileage may vary <laughs> I don't claim to be an expert on anything I, I just have my own experience um, the way uh, the way that I interpret things and the way that I pronounce things uh, things like that might be different from the next person and I encourage everybody to kind of jump in if you know if there's a different way you have of pronouncing a thing or, or what you visualize or something sharing that just uh you know helps other people um you know uh get a little bit more out of this so you're more than welcome to share um let's see here um I, in, as we were talking about prior to the prior to getting started, the thing to keep in mind is it's it's your own approach, it's your magic. Whatever works for you is is what's going to um, that's what's going to make your magic your own, and it's what's going to make it as powerful as it can be. Um, I plan today to kind of go over some of the symbolism. I'm just going to kind of walk through the ritual. I'm going to talk about some of the, the Greek words and what they mean, some of the visualizations, and then really, you know, kind of get into just the practice of it. Um, I am not going to go into the Kabbalah, the Greek terms, but encourage you to uh, look into the Hebrew. Unfortunately, 777, that's only Hebrew. So you'll uh, need to look into the Greek Kabbalah. Um, but uh, I had a little bit of time to put this together, so I didn't want to. I didn't want to open that can of worms. I'd have been <laughs> for a lot longer. So, um, but I encourage you to do that. So, what is the Star Ruby? The Star Ruby is a banishing ritual. It's basically Crowley's improvement on the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. Uh, which traditionally used Hebrew symbolism, Hebrew God forms, angelic forms. Uh, this was Crowley's effort to improve on the ritual while at the same time using new Aeon uh, symbolism. And like I said, there were two different versions of it and we'll kind of discuss each one a little bit. Um, the first one was written in Book of Lies of about 1909 um, and then uh, magic and theory and practice, which was, I believe, the 1930s, or was it late 1920s? I can't remember. Thomas might know. Um, um, magic and theory and practice? Mm-hmm. I think that was in the 20s. I want to say, yeah, either late 20s or early 30s. Yeah, it um, was, it was, 29. year 1926 is popping in my head, but I think that's when he may have started it. So, okay. yeah. Yellow version was 1929. It was, that doesn't surprise me because everything I've read about that is that ma magic and theory and practice um, was definitely a labor of love. And it took him a while. Took him a while. So, um, banishing uh, is an extremely important thing. Um, and as we all know as magicians, 
Crowley had a few things to say about it um, in Magic and Theory and Practice. He said, the first task of the magician in every ceremony is therefore to render his circle absolutely impregnable. If one littlest thought intrude upon the mind of the mystic, his concentration is absolutely destroyed and his consciousness remains on exactly the same level as the stockbroker's. Even the smallest baby is incompatible with the virginity of its mother. If you leave even a single spirit within the circle, the effect of the conjuration will be entirely absorbed by it. And I should note that the bold part uh, on that is uh, Crowley's, not mine. Uh, so, um, but I, this is one of those, one of those quotes I just love. It's just full of Crowleyisms. like even the smallest baby is incompatible with the virginity of its mother. I love that. <laughs> you know, it just puts it in a way that just makes me think about it qu quite differently. Um, but Curly was adamant that, uh, you know, a, a proper banishing should be short. It should, uh, and, and it should be effective. It, you know, the effectiveness of your banishment is of supreme importance. Um, and, you know, even stated that, you know, after, after a while, after you get this ritual down quite a bit, that the actual ritual itself should only take you just a few moments because you'll already have it so internalized that you can just banish. Um, and uh, so let's see, as far as, there was another quote I had here. The banishing ritual of the pentagram is now rewritten, referencing the star ruby, is the best to use. Only the four elements are specifically mentioned, but these four elements contain the planets and the signs. The four elements are tetragrammaton, and tetragrammaton is the universe. This special precaution is, however, necessary. Make exceedingly sure that the ceremony of banishing is effective. Be alert and on your guard. Watch before you pray. The feeling of success in banishing once acquired is unmistakable. Um, and I think any uh, magician can attest to that. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's uh, when looking at the four elements from that standpoint, and again, this is uh, Crowley making you think about things rather than just thinking about just base elements that you're banishing taking into consideration the scope and depth of what that means and the cross references and correspondences that go along with that to the planets, to the signs. Um, and there, anybody have any comments, questions? No, good. Uh, the, um, <laughs> Lever 25 and uh, the LBRP are treatises on elemental magic um, there's a reason you know why in our recommended you know study guides that you know there's a sequence to um, how we go about doing things and um, I didn't actually realize what I'm saying right now until I was about like four or five years into doing LBRPs and uh, Star Rubies. So, you know, it, it, stuff just sneaks up on you with this. Um, so just do them a lot for a long time and write down what your, your notes because it's going to evolve. Yep, well put. And uh, there's, there's one other important uh, thing to, to note when, uh, on the general subject of banishing. A lot of, you know, you're always encouraged to banish and banish frequently, do this ritual a lot, but never for to forget to invoke because that's yeah. really the true, the true thing that you're really trying to do. Yes, you start with a banishing, but if all you ever do is banish, you're gonna find yourself banishing even the good things in your life. I mean, you've got to, in You've got to invoke and you, you must invoke that thing that you are striving to achieve. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're looking to uh, come to know your angel, invoke your angel, you know. Uh, there are many ways of invoking. And one of the great things about the, the Star Ruby, as opposed to the traditional 
LBRP, where you do the banishing in the four corners, and then you immediately go before me, Raphael, behind me, Gabriel. In the Star Ruby, you stop in the middle and invoke NOX. And in, it, again, you have this tetragrammaton. Again, you have this, this, this energy that you're invoking immediately after banishing. And that's an important thing to remember because nature abhors a vacuum. <laughs> if you just keep banishing, sometimes bad things can make their way in anyway, you know? Um, so one thing to keep in mind, I think. Um, so so Steve, yes. uh -huh. so, so as, as a newbie, <laughs> Um, I mean, I've had experiences in banishing where there's been, there's been this rush of power that came in at the end of a banishing. Is that what Crowley is referring to as, as to the, as this unmistakable sense of a successful banishing? I would say so very much. Like I said, you, like he puts it, you know, you know it when it happens, and 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 it's true of anything in magic. You know, they, um, we were talking about the signs, and particularly the sign of four part crod. I have these two images. I mean, one of them uh, is an early uh, Golden Dawn or AA picture. Uh, comes from um, uh, one of the earlier. Crowley books, but again, you can see the person using their right hand. Same thing with the image of uh, Huapar Krat um, in this image. Um, and again, that's basically based on the, the principal signs of Egypt. Um, uh, like I mentioned prior, this sign of silence is usually the index finger up to the lips. However, there are those who have used the thumb in front of the lips, uh, again, symbolizing the babe Horus suckling the thumb. Um, either way is appropriate, whatever works for you, whatever is, is resonates with you is appropriate. So um, of the signs given in this ritual, this one is the first. Um, let me see if I can. Steve, can you Steve, comment yes. on there, there are a plurality of, of names um, associated with that first sign. I was wondering if you could maybe speak to that. As far as uh, the sign of Corporate you've got, Krat, the sign you've of silence. Got, what's that? Right, the sign of silence. Uh, You've got Horpar Krat, the sign of silence, um, sign of the enterer, I believe. Or is that, that no? Coming up on the sign of the okay. So the sign of four part crot is, is, I mean, and silence is a passive sign. And that's, that's one of the aspects. It's the, uh, the god four part, uh, or, uh, um, Heru Raha is, uh, is the twofold essence of Horus, which is four part crot and raw work wheat. Raw work wheat being the active, we're part crop being the passive. And therefore, on our next one, we have the sign of the enterer, which is the sign of Horus, or, uh, rock or wheat. Uh, this is maybe done in a couple of ways. The one that you're looking at on the left um, is the way that uh, most magicians will do it. And that's with the left leg, just or the left foot just forward a bit. You're bent at the waist. You're, you're doing a Superman pose kind of a thing. You're out like this, and it's generally done with that motion. So as you give the sign of the enterer, you're doing like this. The other method, which is uh, you don't see nearly as much, but it is also a viable aspect or, or viable uh, way of doing the sign of the enterer, is more stationary. Um, again, the left foot is forward, but you are upright your hands forward as though you're, you're cupping something, you're, you're in a V shape. And this is also considered the sign of the enter. Again, whatever resonates with you for whatever reason, um, go with that. Um, the next on our, on our signs are the signs of NOx, and this is given after 
going around and vanishing in the quarters. Um, I believe this is Constance Duquette. Am I, am I correct on that, Thomas? Do you know? Not clear, but um, uh, you're the book of the expert, so. I think so. I, think so. I yanked this image off the internet, but I'm pretty sure this is Lon Duquette's wife. <coughs> oh, yeah. No, now, okay, I didn't, I, uh, you are correct. That is Constance. I'm sorry. I didn't, yes. um, I, yeah. Okay. Yes, that's Constance. Constance of the well, yes. So, um and in, in this one is kind of interesting because you know you've got a fourfold sign and this is an invocation, um, and the way it's given here now the the, the 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 order that you do these signs in it varies from magician to magician and again it's up to you. I've seen I, I've done it in a variety of different ways, um, you know, starting with you know, you know the father, the mother the son, the daughter, and in a, in a way of working down the tree of life. I've seen it done the other way, in the other order. You could also do it in this in the uh, order of N-O-X, which would be N-O-X, and then finishing, you know, something like that. But whatever, whichever order you do, there is no way that is, this is the correct way, that way is the wrong way, again. Um, but these signs, you should, you know, at least understand what they are. And with, uh, with pure, you know, you've got again, like I showed a little bit earlier, principal sign of one of the gods of Egypt. Of course, he's kneeling, so his arms up, raised. But it's very much that same uh, type of thing. It is a generative sign. You know, the thumb out like this. It's you know rather obvious. You know, Venus and and you stand like this. Uh, this is the son, um, you know, the daughter, and this is tetragrammaton. You have y down at the bottom right, you have yod. Moving to the bottom left, you have hay. Moving up, you have vav, and over to the top right, you have the final hay. Um, it's just another way of, of giving those signs. So, um, again, some people will also do the sign of Isis rejoicing, which is the fifth NOX sign. It's not pictured here, but it's essentially arms held as though you were holding a babe to your breast. And um, that is, that's the fifth sign. Um, some people use that during the uh, Star Ruby, others don't. And again, personal preference. And so um, getting to uh, next question, <laughs> it's all the Greek. Um, so I'm gonna uh, kind of go over uh, some of this to the best of, of, to the to the best of how I understand it. Again, I'll just say it right out. I don't speak Greek, so I'm not gonna tell you that the way I'm pronouncing it is the way it's pronounced. Um, there are some who tend to go with a more classical Greek pronunciation, uh, some who prefer modern Greek, which is very different sounding. Um, and again, as we've been saying, whatever works for you, your mileage may vary. Um, some of you may pronounce some of these words differently and you're welcome to pop in and, and pronounce them the way that you do just to kind of give us a variation uh, as we go. So I'll just kind of run through some of the Greek that is in this ritual. In the beginning, as you heard Thomas saying earlier, apopantos kakodaimanos, uh, which basically means away every evil spirit. And, and it's done as a cry at the beginning and at the end of the ritual. And again, it's, it's just like, ooh, get away, uh, um, kind of a thing. And, uh, to a lot of magicians, just doing this alone is a banishing um, and can be a very quick, excuse me, a very quick banishing when one is needed just right away. Oftentimes doing this, uh, doing this cry can be considered a very effective banishing. We do the Kabbalistic cross. We've got soy, meaning thine or thy, uh, ophale, 
the phallus, ischyros, which means the mighty, eucharistos, which means the beneficent, and then a vibration of the holy name, e e e a o. Um, and I say a vibration, I mean some of the, some of this uh, Greek is actually meant as kind of an invocation or prayer. It's just spoken in Greek. Other words like e a o are always more uh, effective when vibrated and different people have different ways of vibrating. Um, being male and having a deeper voice myself, I tend to go for the deepest register I can so that I get actual physical vibration when I'm doing these things, and just letting it come up from here. But um, the more energy that you put into these vibrations and these God names and forms, uh, the more powerful, you know, your, your uh, ritual ends up being. So, um, and again, as far as pronunciation, we had a brother in the lodge who, you know, most people pronounce it fale. Um, I, I believe the actual the modern pronunciation is something like pehele or something along that line. I've heard it pronounced that way. Um, again, eucharistos, I've, I've heard that pronounced a number of different ways. So again, whatever, whatever works best for you. My, I'll just add in here, my best advice is do it a thousand times and after that, you're going to know when you've intoned it correctly. You'll just feel it in your body and you'll know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're going to have those weird times when you're experimenting and you're just kind of like, eh, I don't know if that would work. But that's what, that's what learning this is all about, is just that trial and error and finding what specifically works for you. Um, the names of... Power and I wasn't sure... Go ahead. And I wasn't joking when I said a thousand times. That's like, you know, that's basically if you hit four of these a day at the quarters for a year, you can do, you can get that many in. That many in. Mm -hmm. uh, the names of power in this ritual, in the original ritual uh, in Book of Lies, uh, to the east uh, was chaos, to the north, Babylon, to the east, eros and to the west, or, or excuse me, I just went out of order there. To the east, chaos, to the north, Babylon, to the west, Eros, and to the south, Psyche. Um, and this is an interesting interplay, the way that he had these chaos and Babylon, Babylon and chaos being consort of each other, um, and, and they have this divine interplay. The same with Eros and Psyche. Eros was the Greek name for uh, the, what the, who the Romans called Cupid. He was the god of, of love and sex. Psyche was the goddess of the soul. Mm -hmm. um, and there was actually in a uh, in the book Metamorphosis, uh, which is also called The Golden Ass, which was written in the second century by Platonicus. Um, he talks about the love affair between Cupid and Psyche. And uh, that's that's an interesting thing to enter, you know, if you want to go and research that in in line with what Crowley was looking at here with Chaos and Babylon, uh, Eros and Psyche. And now he later updated this to Therion, Nuit, Babylon, and Hadith, which being to me strikes me as being more of a balanced thing um, because we have Therion in the east Babylon in the West, and so they, they basically balance each other. Um, uh, you've got Nuit in the North and Hadid in the South. Again, that balance rather than uh, East and, and North and West and, and South as in the Book of Lies. Uh, it's also interesting to note that only in, in Liber Abba, the only name that is in Greek is Therion, and then the others are printed as you see. So. Uh, he also changed the direction of Babylon, like I noted, um, and it seems it seems appropriate, I think, to put more appropriate to put her in the in the West as opposed to the god of of uh, love and sex, and and so. But that's those are the two different versions. The Liber Abba version is the one most Thelemites do at this point. It's not often that you see someone. 
uh, do the original Book of Lies, though it's always nice when you do see it. It's kind of a refreshing, uh, a refreshing change, and it has its own uh, symbolism and power. I'm like, it's, it's, right, yes. it's interesting that the the characters in the Book of Lies is, um, reminds me of Russian to some extent. Some of the sound, some of the characters, and some of the the, the way they seem to be pronounced. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah. There's, I'm sure there's a, a little bit of a relation between Cyrillic and Greek, but uh, yeah. I just want to pick some praise for Book of Lies as being the best night stand companion that anyone could ever have. Mm -hmm. it, it strikes me, you know, again, because I keep seeing from my background so many parallels with Crowley and Young, and, you know, the, the tale of Psyche and Eros is actually very prominent in Jungian thought. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to me to, to see that, that he used them in the earlier version. I mean, it's it, I have to admit, it's a little sad to me to see that they went away. <laughs> <laughs> also, did they go away or did it transmute? You know, yeah, I mean, there you or, go. You Nothing know, I mean, really like, that's, goes away. Right, you know, I mean, like, that's, that's the whole thing is like, you, you know, you can change the dialogue to a thelemic one, mm -hmm. but on your subconscious level, you know, once you know this ritual in and out, I mean, your brain is calling all of it in. Sure. Yeah. You know, we have a, you know. Good point. Yeah. It's all there. It's, those are just the ashes of previous fires. Yeah. yeah. So then we come to the um, next portion, which after banishing to the quarters, you do the signs of NOX. Um, the ritual says that you cry out EOPAN. Um, most magicians will cry out EOPAN with each sign. Um, it doesn't specifically say that, but you know, um, but that's usually appropriate to do with each of the signs of NOX. Um, and then there are variations on that. I mean, I've heard EO, pan, pan, pan. I mean, you get into this ecstatic thing. Whatever, again, works for you because you are invoking. And so the more energy and the more, the, the more you throw into it, uh, the more effective your invocation will be. So um, just, you know, go ahead and let loose. Pan is... Uh, Pan is the all. Pan is, Pan is not just a satyr who is drunk and lascivious in the forest, though that is an aspect of Pan. Pan is the all begetter. Pan is the all destroyer. Pan is essentially the Greek idea, the, the Greek equivalent of, of Kali Shiva, you know, with that, that constant wheel of life with the destruction, the creation, and it is everything. Um, but takes the form of this lascivious little goat man. And, you know, and, and I think that that's, uh, that's, that's a key to a lot of uh, the symbolism that we use, uh, you know, that, that as above, so below. And, you know, even the most base thing is divine. So, um, and to me, is kind of like the fool in the tarot. Mm -hmm. You look at it and you're just like, mm, yeah, whatever. And, and if you overlook the significance of the symbolism of the fool, um, you know, you've pretty much lost, uh, you've lost the game already before you even start. So it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then we come to the final invocation. First part is promulgis which means before me, Iyungis. So what the heck are Iyungis? Uh, the word uh, is related to the Sanskrit root Iyug, from which we derive the word yoga and by extension union with God. Iyungis, singular Iyunks, are the first of the four Neoplatonic divine principles that are invoked at this point in the ritual. 
um, they could be called the initiators. Um, and they are, again, before you. So as you're standing, when you're doing this ritual, when you're doing any of these rituals, you are essentially, on the tree of life, you're standing before Tifereth. You are standing at Samek and Peh, at the two cross paths of Samek and Peh. Um, so as you are looking before you in this, in this concept, uh, the initiator could be considered to be your own holy guardian angel, you know, and that this is what's before you as you look, you know, toward that, uh, toward up the tree of life, toward Kether through uh, Tifer, or through, yeah, Tifereth. Thank you for acknowledging that your initiator can be your HCA, at least for a little moment. Yes. I think your initi I think your your only real true initiator is your HDA HDA, though you may be initiated in this system or that system. Uh, if you are listening to the voice of your angel, uh, it's your angel leading you through these things. And um, you know, some of the most profound things happen outside of the actual initiation, which is only a door opening that hopefully puts you in better contact with your, with your HGA. The next line is opisomu teletarchi, which means behind me, teletarchi. Uh, the teletarchi are the second of the divine principles invoked. Tele means ultimate or primeval. Archai means to rule. Thus, we have natural law. Um, the teletarchi are the maintainers of that law, the, the hierophants, if you will, of, of the divine order uh, that is everything. And again, considering your, your position on the tree of life with Tifereth behind or in front of you, behind you is, you, you know, Malkuth. And so thinking of natural law to which you are still a part, you are still uh, bound by natural law. Um, but that's, again, a reference to where you're at on the tree of life. Hey, Steve. <laughs> yes. You just explained this to me in a way that, like, kind of popped my brain open a little bit. Um, this is sort of a rhetorical question. I'd like you to chew on it. But, like, does this, like, what, what you're describing here, if you had to find, like, a point in OTO system that, that kind of maps to this, I'm thinking the Areopagus of the eighth degree. And I don't want to, like, that's sort of a tangential thing, but I'm just throwing it out there. I'm going to say something to you that you're talking way up of your pay grade. Yeah, 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 no, yeah, sorry about that, sorry guys. about that, guys. That's why I didn't That's want to go want too deep in this. Way above your pay grade. So, <laughs> so uh, we get to the next line, which is Epidexia Sunokis. Um, on my right hand, the Sunokis. The Sunokis are the perfectors. The word may be interpreted as joining together or passively being held together. Um, it can mean continue. It can mean continuous, and thus hints at the idea of eternity. Um, and again, as you are looking forward on the tree of life, on your right hand is going to be um, well, basically Netzach and Kesed. You're going to have the tree of uh, the, the the pillar of mercy, um, and so you've got that symbolism there. Um, and then we get to, on my left hand, the daimones. Uh, the daimones, the word daimones or daemon, is a reference to the holy guardian angel, your personal genius. Um, in Greece, daimones were the, uh, often referred to, uh, or were a name often used uh, to refer to people who, were, who had their genius or who had achieved high levels of adaptation. Um, and they are called the executors, um, essentially the doers. Uh, and again, you know, here you have Gabora and Hod um, on the tree of severity, on the pillar of severity. 
bringing balance to this. Uh, daemon does not, of course, mean demon. That was a perversion of that, um, but is is considered to be a, a beneficial spirit um, in, in your higher self, holy guardian angel. And then we get to the this little part right here. This is easy, right? <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> Again, your mileage may vary. Uh, <laughs> for about me flames the star of five, and in the pillar stands the star of six. And again, you know, the more you kind of understand at least what these words mean, and you know, and I encourage you all to do further research, you can turn up a whole lot more, look into the, the gematria going on with the, with the Greek letters. Um, and you can really flesh this out. But at this point in the ritual, you should be visualizing, you know, the flame, the, the pentagrams that you just sent out about you and the star of six in a pillar about you. And, and you know, you should be able to visualize this and, and work on visualizing that as clearly as you can. Um, and speaking of visualization, the ruby star. Now, the ritual itself, um, and in fact, here I've got the Book of Lies. There we go. Let me see, where is it? Imagine strongly a pentagram, a right in thy forehead. Um, so this would suggest that the pentagram on the left would be what we're looking at as far as a, an, a right ruby star. However, I also know that there are many who prefer to picture the star on the right, which is the averse ruby star. Again, whatever floats your boat, whatever works for you, whatever gives you the visualization you need. And, I, and, and each would be appropriate in different circumstances too, depending on what it is that you're doing. But um, in the traditional LBRP, oftentimes you are instructed to visualize, say, for example, in the east, like a flaming yellow pentagram, you know, or in the north, maybe a black pentagram or indigo and, and you know, similar around the, the, the circle. With the star ruby, it's generally speaking, and again, Others may disagree, others may do it differently, but generally from what I've understood from people, you're, you're picturing a ruby red star and sending that out into all four quarters. Any thoughts or ideas on that before we move on? Okay. I, I was thinking the, the, the previous stuff it's interesting for me to try to read it out like loud in Russian and then try to see their English translation because it, it reads slightly differently. <laughs> try to. Yeah. Is it, you know, it, it seems yeah, yeah. Some, some, some of the words are like really close to Russian. So that's, that's really interesting. <laughs> I'd encourage you to look into that some more, you know, maybe you may turn something up there, you know, there, yeah. there it's, and, and these, are, these rituals are rather adaptive too. I mean, once you really start getting into them, um, you can, uh, you know, you can start playing with them and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in, in just a bit. Um, the works I cited, just, just FYI, Crowley's Book of Lies, Magic and Theory and Practice, um, which is also found in Lieber Abba before. May I ask a personal question? I also have a, a couple things that I've collected over the years. Yeah. Have you met Bob Stein? Go ahead. I have. Okay. Yeah. Is it? Bob's a, he is Bob's an amazing, a half. amazing, yeah, yeah, yep. And the first time I met Bob Stein, he cornered me and asked me whether, whether it really says Zadi is not the star in the handwritten 
look at the law. And I was like, <laughs> a man at the time. and I'm just like, what? I yeah, think was, that was his AA thesis for, uh, you know, getting in or something like that. <laughs> it wouldn't not surprise me. <laughs> he's, yeah, he'll, he'll, he's asked me some of the most peculiar questions. Yeah. Uh, of anybody I've ever met. He just asks me really good questions. Okay, well, I'm glad you know him because I do know him very well too. Um, okay, yeah. And yeah, Bob's wonderful. I haven't seen him in forever, and someday I'll get back he's to He's really him. old uh, now. He's in his 80s. He's I know. 80s. I know. My time's running out. I got I to gotta run into him again. I have questions. His wife died him. on him, you know, <laughs> so he's only got a few people left. His yep. family, but that's it. So anyway, these are some of the some of the sources that I went through. Uh, there was a wonderful write-up in the in the continuum number three from 1983, which you might be able to find a copy online. Um, as far as the Aleister Crowley books, if you're looking for something like that, um, hey, you'll find it in our store, Second Mart. <laughs> Click the link on our on our website, and I mean we have both of the lives. We have Libra Abba. We've got a ton of other Crowley stuff, and um, so yeah. Um, so now I was kind of thinking that um, we could play around with this ritual a little. I, I I thought we'd start off with just and uh, we can just actually go through the script. It's short. Um, and then I can actually demonstrate to you uh, my own, the way that I personally do the Star Ruby, which is probably different than other people. But um, I would also encourage you to even as we're doing this walkthrough um, with the script, if you kind of want to, in whatever way, follow along just so that you are um, you know, just kind of go through the motions even a little bit, you know, if you've got room to stand up, maybe move around and you want to try to do the ritual even, you know, silently, if you don't know the words, that's fine, but um, play around with it a little bit. So the ritual begins with the magician facing east. And I'll, I'll get myself up here. Um, facing east. In the center of your circle, draw deep, deep, deep thy breath, closing thy mouth with thy right forefinger pressed against thy lower lip, then dashing down the hand in a great sweep back, expelling forcibly thy breath, cry out, Apapantos Kakodaimanos! With the same forefinger, touch thy forehead and say, Soy, thy member, and say, Ophale, thy right shoulder, and say, Iskuros, thy left shoulder, and say, Ukaristos, and clasp thy hands, locking thy fingers, and cry, Advance to the east. Imagine strongly a pentagram, a right in thy forehead. Drawing the hands to the eyes, fling it forth, making the sign of Horus and roar, Therion! Retire thy hand in the sign of Hurapod Croc. Go round to the north and repeat, but say, Nuit. Go round to the west and repeat, but whisper, Babylon. Go round to the south and repeat, but bellow, Hadith.
completing the circle, Wittershins, retire to the center and raise thy voice and pan with these words, Eopan, and the signs of NOX. Extend thy arms in the form of a towel and say low but clear, Promui Yungis, Opisumu Teletarkai, Epidaxia Sinokis, Eparistera Daimones, Flegigar Perimuo Hasterton Pente, Kaiende Stelehi Hoasterton Hexistaki. Repeat the Kabbalistic cross as, as above, as thou didst begin. Soi, O Fale, Iskros, Eucharistos, Iao. pantos Kakataimanos. And there you have the star ruby in, in kind of a walkthrough. Does anybody have any questions, thoughts on any of that? Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome, Steve. Steve. Thanks. Steve, I guess Steve I was able to follow up. Steve, I guess I, sorry, go ahead. I've never come across what the sign of Horus is. And, and that's the sign of Horus would be the sign of the enterer. Oh, okay. We're going like that. That's okay. That's the sign of okay. Horus. Okay. I, I hadn't heard so, called that. I hadn't heard called that. Thank you. Now, um, I mentioned earlier the Kabbalistic cross. Um, that's the way I just kind of did it is just kind of doing it the way that, uh, that most people do it, the way, um, That's the way it's you know. Been uh, a long, long time. So no apologies, yeah. brother. <laughs> so I, I, have, I have a different way of doing the Kabbalistic cross itself. And it's just for me, it's a matter of, of visualization and becoming essentially a cross of light and instead of using just one hand here and like this like this i'm i'm basically bringing my hands together above my head and bringing the light down to soy o fale iskeros eucharistos iao and like that um and it's just again that's just a different way, but the, the only reason I show you that is basically to encourage you to play with this. There is no, this is the way it's done and that way is wrong or whatever. Make it yours. Um, understand uh, what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, and that's, that's basically the best advice I can give on that. Um, so Crowley introduced us to it. In his own way. So, Steve. Yes. Uh, I had a question on when you were you were saying that you're standing at pay, like as if you were looking at the tree of life. Mm -hmm. um, the Gnostic mass is that they almost it's almost set up like the tree of life as well, right? And in that it's, it's not almost set up like the tree of life. It is set up like yeah. the tree of life. Yes. <laughs> so the, tomb is is Mal, the tomb is Malkuth. The font is Yesod. The uh, altar, the deacon's altar, the fire altar is, uh, uh, is Tifereth. Um, and then, of course, the, the stele of revealing, which sits above the priestess on the um, altar, is Kether. And then of course we have the two pillars, white and white and dark, which are Kokma and Bina. Yeah. The entire temple is the tree of life. 
And yeah, so like, going into it and watching an agnostic mass and 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 understanding that symbolism um, helps you get a little bit more out of the mass. Yeah, well, and they they really want to like nail home that that tree of life. I've noticed in a few different of the rituals. <laughs> well, you, these are kabbalistic rituals, and the tree of life is a kabbalistic glyph. And whether or not you have this profound, deep understanding, and you can rattle off the correspondences off the top of your head, or whether your understanding is really basic and you kind of have an idea, the more of an understanding you have of the tree of life, the better, the, the better you will understand the symbolism in Crowley's rituals particularly, because that's the language he spoke. And so if you learn that language, you'll get more out of his rituals. And it's, it can be cumbersome learning, learning the language of, of the Kabbalah. It's definitely a challenge. <laughs> it takes a lot of study, <laughs> you know? but it's worth it in the end. And, and you, you know, it, everything fits into this system. Um, so. Yeah, no, it was pretty cool to see how you see kind of like that going through a, diff a lot of different rituals. And then I had one other question. I know it kind of pertains to something we were talking about last week in the class. Um, <clears throat> Brandon was saying like the more people that we have, like sort like uh, last week we were talking, Brandon was saying we had more people with that LBRP ritual and that like it felt more intense having more people. Mm -hmm. Can you increase that intensity depending on how many people you can have with different rituals? Like oh, absolutely. Rituals? I mean, if you're working together in, in sync with each other, um, I don't think that there's, you know, uh, there's, it, it, it only adds power to that. Um, but again, it requires being in sync with each other. Sometimes solitary or, or, or two people rituals can be, you know, really powerful because those people can focus, you know, you can focus your energy better. Um, but we've done some amazing group rituals uh, at Second Bot that, and, and that actually, you know, it was doing that kind of a thing. And even group banishings. We have done group star rubies and, and things like that. And, you know, it's, it's really kind of a neat, ex, ex, neat experience. So, certainly. Yeah, I, I was going to suggest, like, being a soul practitioner most of my life, that um, you could experiment with setting up energy points that are kind of you know taking in energy or moving energy around or doing whatever or whatever shape you really desire to do that with it gets a little bit more complicated if you have to continuously focus on them but i have played around with that that can get interesting so points. So, Steve, um, uh -huh. sometimes, uh, so the times that I've seen the star ruby, um, most often have been has been one in person. But I've usually seen like body and and foot positions associated with the NOX signs. So is that just a personal addition? I, I'm sorry, the so, so, oh, sorry, sorry. The times that I have seen the Star Ruby performed, right? Um, most often, it's been one person, mm -hmm. but I've usually seen like body and foot positions mm -hmm. associated with the signs and with the NOX signs. So those are just personal additions. Those are not actually part of it. I, I'm not really follow. I mean, I'm not really different body <laughs> positions. So, so like different ways of doing the signs. No, like a foot raised and, I mean, you know, like, like standing, like the rest of the body positioned in different ways, like, like a foot raised off the ground in different positions and such while giving yeah. Nick, that sounds like an embellishment uh, by the uh, magician, which is totally doable. Um, you'll often find, if you go to the source material like we studied today, the rituals 
are really, really simple and people, you know, add to them uh, for either effectiveness, experiment, or, you know, they think it's cool. You know, there's, there's so many different, you know, for every embellishment, there's a different reason, you know, and everybody maybe think of it in a different way too. So you got to be careful with that. Yeah. You know, this is cool I'll move. Send somebody a down a, a, a rabbit hole that doesn't exist. I, I, I was, Nick, are you asking like during Gnostic mass in general? Yeah. Like, no, um, just a, at, at some events we've seen uh, that we've held where somebody's performed the star Ruby and I've seen them like in physical, in like physical postures with their, with their legs and, you know, I, you'd, I, I'd have to, I, if you, if you, if we had like a, an actual like video or we were at right. the thing. And, I, uh, yeah. I think I, I know I, what he's talking about. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So with the, with the signs of Knox and it, please correct me because I, I think, I think I'm already confused. Um, I've heard two different, okay, between the star Ruby and the star Sapphire. Oh. There's two different. Oh, uh, very good. Knox. And so with the foot raise, that's part of sapphire. That's like the N-O-N. You don't raise your foot in the star. Yes. yes. But you do yeah, that, widen your the, those are the signs of Those are the signs of LVX. And okay. I think that if you look back yeah, that, on that. That's very good, Wendy. Uh, oh, thanks. You know, nice those, catch. And then there, there is a lifting of the leg with the sign okay. of the morning of Isis. Sign of Apophis and Typhon. Okay. Sign of that's, that's my confusion. Yeah. Okay, thank I you. I think that's Thanks. maybe what. And yes, in the in in the Star Sapphire, you okay. do both NOX and LVX. Oh, and okay. so. All right. So that's my confusion. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, to elaborate a little bit too, we were talking about how you can play with this ritual. Um, and I'll give you an example of something that I kind of came up with a while back. Uh, it's a way of doing a star ruby, or literally any banishing ritual. You could you could do the LBRP too, um, but do it basically doing the star ruby for a subject that cannot, for whatever reason, do a banishing themselves, but really really wants and needs one. Um, and it's essentially the basically the same thing. And then and, and you sit down with the with the person and tell them to take whatever it all that anxiety that they're trying to banish and visualize it above their head in a glowing red star. And then as I call out the names, they're to see the star just little by little just vanish. And um, the way that I move around the circle rather than starting in the east facing east. I started in the west facing east, so across the circle with the subject in the middle and Therion, you know, and then move around to the south, but facing north, Nuit, Babylon, Hadid, and on the final Hadid, they're, they, they're instructed to just see the thing vanish and then do the signs of NOx. And, and do that. And I've actually had some, some interesting luck with this, you know, doing this with somebody. Um, and uh, kind of meant to do a, an example at the lodge and then we got shut down, so. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and, you know, success, failure, whatever, success is your proof, I guess. But the bottom line is you can take these rituals and tweak them here and, you know, you know, put something up there and do this, you know, make them your own. As long as you know why you're doing what you're doing, it's your magic. And um, any other questions, thoughts? Thank you, That's, that was pretty cool. Yeah, no, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you guys for tuning in. Um, please, like I said, consider making a donation before you go um, or, or stopping into our store and buying some swag. We, we like that too. We've got a lot of stuff. And uh, thank you all for, for attending today. Love is the law. Love under will.